Hello, uh, so my name's Joel Dunning and I'm here with the one and only uh, Professor Dawn Jaruzinski, uh, who I call the Queen of Pectus. Uh, and the reason I'm here at the Mayo Clinic in Phoenix is that uh, we have actually got a very large randomised trial going on in the United Kingdom called Restore. And Dr J has been advising us massively on it. She's going to be on some of our committees uh, and she has helped us with a huge amount of our protocols uh, to, to basically hope Hopefully create the world's biggest randomized trial in, uh, in Pectus. Uh, but the reason for doing this video is that we really want to hear all your insights and tips about the absolute perfect best way uh, to do Pectus surgery. Uh, and, and a lot of surgeons certainly um, are, are have slightly lower experience, certainly in the UK, because we haven't been doing it for a while. Uh, and, uh, and you're an absolute expert in the higher age patients and the higher Haller index patients. You've done 1,200 pectus operations, uh, you've, uh, you've done 200 on redos, which means you've seen a lot of the mistakes. Uh, and so we want to hear all about uh, how uh, we can avoid those mistakes in our trials. So thank you very much for inviting me here. Uh, we saw a nice 17 year old this morning and then a 47 year old with a hair index of 12. Yep. Uh, beautiful results afterwards. So, so maybe if we get jumped straight in, what would you say are you know, just a few of the absolute key important issues in doing a good uh, safe pectus operation well number one is you have to see mm -hmm. so if you can't see it it's it's not safe and always use a camera uh, I, I think it always astounds me that there are surgeons out there that still do this procedure without a camera and without seeing in the chest and I, I am a complete believer of sternal elevation whether it's with a clamp um, through the sternum, above the sternum, with a screw, a hook underneath, a hook around, um, a vacuum bell, however it is that you lift the sternum, I'm a, a true believer in sternal elevation. It makes it easier, it takes the blunt force of the twisting, it decreases your risk of fracturing, of you know, damaging the tissues and it makes it so you can actually see across the mediastinum and it makes it a safer procedure. Uh, you know, I, I did it for years without it and now that I started using it, I won't do a procedure without it. Um, Absolutely, and you helped us with some international guidelines uh, with uh, as president of Seawig, uh, and and in those pectus care guidelines, I mean, we literally say, you know, that's probably the number one safety step, isn't it, uh, to use that. And and if somebody doesn't have a rule tract or, or this or that, just even how how would you recommend they start by elevation? So you could, yeah, <laughs> no. yeah. I, I mean, if you you have a resident or you have a partner, you can tr trade people yeah. around, and they can hold it up while you're doing part of the case and you know you can even get a hook from the bottom and lift it up from below mm. um, you know there's different ways to do it and, and lift it up but you know yeah. it's it's nice if you have a crane on the side of the bed mm. you know there's there's different companies that make different um, apparatus that attach to the side of the bed that lift it but um, you know we use rule rule track um, park has his crane apparatus um, the guys in Argentina have a have a you know apparatus Thompson makes a retractor that fits on both sides of the bed and hooks in the middle and pulls up um, yeah. you know you can use some of your general surgery retractors that go across and you know they go across the bed and hook something to that that pulls okay. up you know there's all kinds of yeah. In yeah. innovative ways to come with, with something but yeah. you know the secret is getting something that's not in your way so you can actually see. Yeah, and the second thing I really liked uh, was once you'd elevated, you really opened the mediastinum very widely, didn't you? And that yep. just, that's another like key element uh, of, of getting good vision, isn't I it? Do, so, yeah. Yeah. I do, yeah. Not everybody likes to do that, but I, I personally opened up all the pleura on both sides and just widened it up so I could see very well. Um, I can see what the person on the other side is doing <laughs> and I can see what I'm doing. Yeah. And um, you know that that pleura closes pretty quickly afterwards, so I don't I, ha I haven't had a problem with that, and and you know a number of cases, and I know several people that do that that have done you know several thousand cases and not had an issue with that. Yeah, uh, and so I guess the next issue is is numbers of bars. You know, Don and us started with one bar. Uh, we all start with one, and then we progress to more and more two. And actually, you just told me today that actually you're now in seventy percent of patients using three yep. bars. Uh, yeah. And I guess uh, tell us about your evolution to number of bars, and you know why more bars makes better safer surgery. 
So I initially I was doing three bars and only really big patients and men. And then as time went on, I found that um, as I was pulling bars out of patients, I was like, wow, that, that patient would have looked a lot better if I had done three bars in them. And they were caving in a bolt up here. They looked okay at the time of the repair, but when they came back three years later or three and a half years later, they had sagged in here, they had caved in here below the lower bar, and I really wasn't happy with that repair. So then I started doing more three bars and then more patients were coming back and then those patients I didn't do three bars on, I was like, wow, I really should have done three bars on this patient. And so it kind of snowballed and, and the patients that I tend to do two bars in more often in women because women tend to not want to be as corrected up as high as the, as the men do. And I found that if I wasn't doing bars and a lot of patients low enough, I actually wasn't correcting their cardiac compression complete. And if I look at patients that I do a lot of redos and I've redone some of my patients, my redos have mostly been because I didn't fix their cardiac compression completely and they were still having symptoms and I was like, why, why does this patient still have symptoms? And we did an echo, and not just a supine echo, but an echo where they sat up and leaned forward. It was because these lower costal cartilages were still collapsing in. They were still putting compression on the heart. And they would tell me, they, they'd say, hey, every time I bend over, I get short of breath, I get tachycardic, I have palpitations. And sure enough, you get a positional echo and you see that compression, and it's right below their bar where I didn't put a lower bar. And so I'd become very paranoid about that because when they were laying flat on the table, it looked like they were corrected. But when they sat up, that lower cartilage collapsed in and you know I wasn't fixing that. And that was a lesson that I learned. It was a mistake that I made early on that you know now if there's any question, I put a lower bar down underneath there. Yeah, and you've got no hesitation about going a little bit below the zippy sternum nope. whatsoever. Uh, well, you most know. of those bars are. It's, yeah. I mean, it's well well below the base of the sternum. Yeah. And you know, the biggest problem with that is trying to secure those bars because they rotate very easily, and that's where the medial stabilizers and you know the bridges have become really important of trying to lock bars together so they don't rotate. Because if you just put a lateral stabilizer out here, those bars mm -hmm. are going to move because there's nothing here in the middle there's no sternum here mm -hmm. and you're you're basically if you just put it out here that bar just rolls out it's very hard to secure those bars yeah so so massive really important message isn't it that sort of don't don't stop and don't worry about going too low because actually it's the bit the low bottom bit is the bit that's really going to get good cardiovascular outcomes and certainly for our restore trial it's especially important that we get good cardiovascular outcomes because you know that's going to be the key to getting a good outcome yeah. so so then you've already half mentioned you know how do we stop these things flipping displacing moving you know what's what's the key to making sure these bars don't move well i think there's two things there and, and it's very easy when you look at an x-ray to see a bar that turns caudal or cephalid, right? Mm -hmm. Up or yep. down. That's obvious. Mm -hmm. What's not so obvious is what we call posterior lateral migration, which is when the bar moves this way. And you can only see that on a lateral x-ray. And sometimes it's really even hard to see on a lateral, but you can 100% see it on a CT scan that's when a bar rips through your intercostal muscle and moves posteriorly. The problem with that bar is it looks perfectly straight on a, you know, an AP x-ray or PA x-ray, but it's not pushing out anymore. So you can look at an x-ray and the bar looks perfect on that x-ray and the patient's not corrected at all, but that bar can actually be smashing into their heart and can be very dangerous. It can be a deadly bar. And um, we've taken out some of those bars that were to a point where they were close to killing a patient. And getting them out, we almost killed a patient because they had eroded through their aorta and we took part of the wall of the aorta with us <laughs> with the bar mm -hmm. because, because they had eroded into the aorta. 
Uh, but that person would have died if that bar wouldn't have come out. So those are very dangerous bars. Well, that's a bar movement just as dangerous or bad as a bar movement this way. So how do you prevent a bar from moving this way? That is kind of the number one problem that you see in adults is because the weight of their chest wall, the weight of the sternum is too great for the pressure of that bar. So it rips through the intercostal muscle. And it may be that you actually put the bar in at surgery and, and it stayed, but the first time they cough or sneeze or push up, that bar rips through and so it changes. Sometimes it happens in intraoperative and it rips through, but a lot of times it happens within that first week or two of the surgery that those bars rip through and move. And so one technique that we use that's been very successful is what we call a hammock stitch. And this is not the greatest of models, but basically it's just tying around the ribs with a fiber wire stitch. And so fiber wire is just a, like a woven PTFE, what they make vascular grafts with. But you're going, if the bar is gonna be in this rib space, you go around the rib above and the rib below, so it's like a hammock. So then the bar subsequently will be going in here so that when it's in, it's sitting on this hammock versus the intercostal muscle. So then the bar can't rip through, it can't fall through. So it stays in that inner space. And you put one on each side before you put the bar in. And that you, makes that, sense. Yeah, absolutely, it makes fabulous sense. And, so and you put one both sides. Correct, we do Is it on right? both sides. And so for my adult patients, my bigger patients, and for my practice, which is predominantly older and big patients, we do it on almost all our intercostal spaces. Mm. Maybe we won't, if we do three bars and we have a high one, we maybe won't put it on the high space because it's not a lot of pressure up here. Mm. But 100% we do it on these lower bars because mm. they have a tremendous amount of weight and pressure on them. Mm. And you know they, they tend to rip out. And if they rip out just a little bit and that bar moves back, a, even if it moves back just a centimeter, you just lost a centimeter of the forward push of your repair, your repair just dropped back. Mm. And so you, you just lost your repair. Mm. I mean, it's still, it's still okay, right? But it's not as great as it was. If it moves back a lot, now your bar's pushing into the heart. And if it moves back more, now your bar can be lethal. And so it can be a big problem. And if it moves back enough and it rotates, maybe you notice it on your x-ray but you may not even notice it. And it, it can be very dangerous without you know, a CT scan following it up. And so it's critical that you prevent those bars from moving in that direction. Yeah. And so what would you say to surgeons that are not so happy with that? Could they use a horizontal stabilizer plate, one on either side, or is, is, is that something acceptable to do as well? Or, or? So the, the, the a lateral stabilizer out on the side mm -hmm. won't fix it at all, nor yeah. will a bridge. A bridge won't keep it, the bridge is perfect for keeping the bar from, mm -hmm. like you lock two bars together, it'll keep those bars from turning side to side for mm -hmm. sure. They won't yeah. twist, but it won't keep it because they can still as a unit fall in. Yeah. Um, so if you're going to use a, 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 a plate, then it has to be kind of right over the anterior more margin. There, but isn't? even this far out medially, yeah. it doesn't fix the problem as That's well as you'd like. It helps, yeah. but it doesn't do it yeah. as well. Now crossbars, if you do crossbars, it does help yeah. quite a bit. Okay. And so doing crossbars is one way to help prevent stripping because it, it takes the line of the bar out directly on the on the intercostal space. And so doing okay. crossbars and locking is one of the methods that, that's helpful mm. in preventing stripping. <coughs> but mm. it does create more more pressure on the ribs and so for your really brittle adults you can get more fractures doing that, trying to get the yeah. bars in on crop at crosses. Yeah, and so, so then maybe we move to fractures. You, you've caused a fracture here, actually. Yeah, so, and, uh, so I created actually, a really good fracture on my yeah. patient here. But so actually, the, 
let us know where, where you, the fractures most commonly happen. So, so you get a really bad 47 year old, you know, Haller of 12, mm -hmm. you know, we're, so we're at high risk of fracturing. Where would they fracture and what would you do about it? So your most common sites of fracture are going to be your transition zones between your cartilage and your bone out laterally mm -hmm. or your sternum itself mm -hmm. where, it, where it really curves in yeah. or where your ribs attach to your sternum. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, and except the really tours, like if you have a very asymmetric sternum where you're trying to untours, then they'll tend to, to break off right at where they attach to the sternum when you're trying to untwist it. But the majority of your really kind of random, normal, fairly symmetric pectus, they'll break out here. This is where they're weak. If they just crack, you can take a fiber wire and you can wrap it around like in a figure of eight and tie that down mm -hmm. and bring that back together and stabilize it and then you can just put a bar in. Mm -hmm. If it breaks and separates then you got to put a plate on that. You got to take that bar out and you have to put a plate on that and usually you can just open this incision, widen it up and lift it up and put a little plate there just like you would any sort of car accident, you know, trauma, rib fracture. Put the plating on and then put your bar back in. Yeah. Put your figure of eight, because you have to take your figure, you have to cut your hammock, sit, sit all that out, start from the very beginning. Then put your hammock back in, put it around the plate, and then put your, because now you have no intercostal muscle because you just <laughs> lost all your intercostal muscle half the time when you yeah. fractured and broke. Mm -hmm. And then you have to you have to put the hammock in because otherwise your yeah. bar There's won't won't, yeah. won't stay where you need it to, mm -hmm. and then you put your bar in. Yeah, and then you obviously do quite a few other stabilizing sutures. You put a little suture around through the eyelet, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and and then around every rib actually that that it crosses mm -hmm. over. And uh, what, what would you say are the advantages uh, of doing that? Um, well, people tease me and tell me I don't need to do all the stitches, but um, I'm paranoid and mm -hmm. the worst case scenario to me is if the patient comes back with their bar having moved. So I keep putting stitches on even though um, maybe I don't need to put all these, but I basically anywhere the bar crosses a rib, so for you have one on the end, I'll tie it here, it crosses this rib here, so I'll put a tie around here. It'll cross here, so I'll put one here, and then the same thing on this side. So each bar will tend to get, you know, six to seven ties. Yeah. And it's usually a different rib, so it's stabilized at, you know, different transition, you know, multi-point mm -hmm. fixation. Um, it locks it in pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I guess just a quick note on removing the bar then. Mm -hmm. So so you've got all this fiber wire, you know, obviously um, uh, the ones through the eyelets you'll have to cut, but, but mostly you don't have to cut these on removal, do you? No, so. the lateral ones will take out um, the, I, I try to take out everything I can reach because, uh, and feel, um, I, Although fiber wire is meant to be a permanent suture and orthopedic uses it for all their bone and tendon re repair, they never take it out. So it, it, is, it is fine if you leave it in. I'm still one of those people that, that doesn't like to leave things in patients if you don't need to. So when I come back, I'll take out, you know, I'll open their both pockets and I'll take out everything I can find and feel. Um, but if, it, if it's not felt, it stays behind and the ties will loosen up to the ears and so the bar slides through very easily and, and comes out so you don't have to take all the ties out. Um, the older bars that have the serrations can catch on the ties a little bit and so you, you don't want to twist and turn because that can cause bleeding but you can just wiggle it slightly and it'll those little serrations will will come around through the ties but those serrations can catch but the the smoother bars if they just slide right past it there's nothing to hold them at all they come right through yeah so so you told me you, you've taken out 1500 bars in 600 patients and you've scared the hell out of me all about bleeding <laughs> uh, so but you always prep the groins every time yep. you go always. through the protocols always. with all your patient or your staff yep. but, but you have a few hints and tips for if you do get bleeding yep. so maybe tell us if the track starts bleeding well first of all don't twist too much it's a pull yep. pull uh, straight that, yeah pull, pull straight, straight. 
And then and you know, I see it all the time because the residents will be helping us and they go to pull a bar and they turn it sideways like this and they're gorking because your pocket's down here and they're trying to get it out so they're, they're pulling and I'm like, you don't want to do that. You don't want this sharp edge up. So you want to make sure your bar is nice and flat and you're pulling it straight. We unbend one side. We unbend it flat. And you don't want that tip up so it's scraping. You know, you want it fairly, and if it's curved down a little bit, that's fine, but you, you know, you want it fairly flat. Um, as you're pulling out, there's two, there's two patients. There's your very thin patient and your bar tracks right in front of you that you can see and you can easily access. You can find that track again, because it's a fairly good size hole, that track. Mm -hmm. That patient, I won't tie anything to the end of the bar because I know I can find that track if I have bleeding. And then there's the American patient that's, you know, 120, 150 kilos, and it's a high bar that's just mounded with fat that once that bar is out, I will never find that hole again. That patient, I'm going to put a fiber wire or an umbilical tape or something on the end because as I'm pulling that bar out, if I get bleeding, I want to have access. I can tie a Raytag, I can tie something to the end, I can drag it into that track to try to help tamponade off bleeding. Mm -hmm. It's still not completely ideal because I, I want to be able to shove in and I like these little nasal pledges that they use for ENT for the bleeding. We have them, we soak them in uh, epinephrine, we shove them in the track. I still shove in a Raytag or something because they're not very thick and so sometimes you need more bulk, but you want to shove it in and it's almost always your mammary and so we'll just sit there and I mean, we'll literally put all our body force down on the top of the chest and push in. Yeah. And you can usually, between packing in and pushing on the outside, you can stop that bleeding. Yeah. But it's. It's kind of like when you turn on a hose on high power, I mean, it just pours out and you put your finger on it. I mean, it's, it's audible bleeding. It's pretty yeah. scary when it happens. Um, so and it happens so, to any of us. Press really hard, press on these spaces, press. pack, uh, and, uh, and I'm not going to say press, pack, and pray, yeah. but uh, pack and prepare. Can, yeah. Maybe prepare is better. Yeah. Maybe get some other stuff in the room, get ready to maybe get your suction. do a little yeah. vats. And you can or, get your yeah. finger in the hole. Yeah. And so what what yeah, really panics that. everybody in the room is when it just starts like a hose pouring out the sides. I mean, yeah. if you want to see anesthesia run and everybody in the room have a heart attack. Yeah. Um, so if you can, before you, because if you're trying to get your pledges with Epi and it takes them a few seconds and there's, it just looks like a ton of blood coming out of the patient. Yeah. And so if you can get your finger in there and while they're scrambling, trying to get, you know, to bakey and get your pledges or get you a Raytag or whatever else, if you can just shove your finger in the hole and keep it from squirting out yeah. on both sides. Because yeah. as soon as you plug this side, it comes yeah. out the other side, you know? And so if you have, yeah. if you can plug it yeah. up, then everybody can like calm down. Okay. Um, yeah. and, and you, everything's just not welling up with blood. So suction in your finger to get control of it. And then it keeps you from panicking quite as much too, because you yeah. don't feel like your pa the patient's exsanguinate to death in front of you. Yeah. Well, let's move on from that because that's already made me feel sick. Let's, let's talk about something altogether cooler, uh, and it's cryonalgesia. You know, um, if people aren't using cryonalgesia, should they? And how many spaces should they be using? Oh, absolutely. I love cryo. Um, I will. I will tell you that I did not use cryo for years after it came out. Um, it took them a long time to convince me to use cryo. Um, I was around when they brought cryo out the first time, and they had a lot of problems with it. So it took me some convincing to, and a few years of watching it to make sure that there weren't issues with it this time before I would use it on young healthy people. Um, it makes a huge difference. We had a really good regimen of controlling pain before, but it was a regimen that was a ton of narcotics. They, they felt good, <laughs> but they were taking a lot of drugs. And so if you look at our pain scores, before and after in the paper we wrote be, with the on -cue catheters and the cryo, our pain scores weren't any different. But if you look at the amount of narcotics and how long they took it, it's a huge difference. And so our patients are doing really well now. They're going home one to two days and they're not taking a lot of narcotics. 
and that's the difference. Um, and I think that's really important because um, you know the the addiction rate with those drugs and the dependency and the recovery is is tremendously better. Yeah, and using the very latest probe, only 90 yep. seconds. I know, the new one's 90 seconds, yeah. it's really quick. And, yeah. and what levels do you fast. tend to do? So yeah. I do three through nine on everybody. Mm. Um, mm. When I put my camera in, I go, as I, you know, I put insufflate with CO2 first, so the diaphragm goes down, and I will go as low as I can with the camera, which is the ninth inner space. So I cryo it all the way down to nine. Yeah. Um, and, and of kind of you've used it so many times, you know, when you get them, when you're taking the bars out, you know, do you see many people a few years later with that many problems? Nope. You know, yeah, so, so yeah. And you've, you've taken mm -hmm. 600 patients' bars out and, yep. and so yeah, you're not seeing lots of problems, nope. lots of numbness, lots of tingling. You, so you do, everyone worries about yeah, all this. Well, you, so. do get, you do get some numbness and the, the reality, and it's one of the things I spend a lot of time with when I talk to these patients. There's no way that you're going to go in, lift up their pec muscles, shove these bars into their chest, and do all this without damaging some of the nerves on their chest. And mm. they will have some residual spots of numbness. Some of them will have big patches. Like some of them can tell you exactly where their bars were with yeah. you know numb spots. Yeah. And some of them will have almost no numbness, and others will have a lot of numbness. And it's a factor of how they heal and how their nerves regenerate. And I think it's a, an important part of their consent that they understand that that's a, a real possibility. And if the worst thing in the world to them is that they can't feel their chest, then they need to seriously consider not having the operation because that, that's a high chance. Yeah. And you get numbness from the, the bars, it, don't you? So you've you got it's it before not, cryo and it's, it's easier. Yeah, it's not yeah. the cryo. Yeah. It, it's, it is from the surgery, not cryo. And I try to stress that because most of my bar removals are from before cryo mm -hmm. that, that are in my series. And that, that hasn't changed at all with cryo. Yeah, so, so, so people shouldn't freak if they're seeing people with numb chests because yeah. you know, that's part of putting bars in. Really, yeah, it, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's unfortunate, but it's mm -hmm. a part of any surgery that you do. Surgeons mm -hmm. damage nerves. Yeah, great. Uh, and then I guess uh, some local anesthetic in the chest as well. You use mm -hmm. bupivacaine, 60 bupivacaine yep. with 10 of dexamethasone yep. as we well. We use a little dex. Yeah. It, um, it helps with the and swelling. It helps propagate the, the um, marking too. Yeah. Great, yeah, and I think, uh, well, that's certainly a lot that I've learned uh, today. We've actually done a video, yeah. uh, so hopefully we're going to publish a video all about uh, your exact technique. But, uh, but yeah, thank you so much for, for hosting me here. Yeah, it's and been I great. Hope we all learn. It's very and, exciting. I think yeah. this, this trial is critical, and it's, you know, it's, very, it's important to the whole world that, mm -hmm. um, that this, is, this is successful. Yeah, and that we do it properly. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. That's great.